Hi, everyone. Welcome to the CSPI podcast. Uh, I'm here with Jimmy Sawney. He's the author of The Founders, the story of PayPal, and the entrepreneurs who shaped Silicon Valley. Jimmy, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Richard. Thanks for having me, and thanks for doing this. Yeah, we're glad to have you. So um, you uh, can you tell the audience a little bit about your background? Uh, what do you do? Um, what's you know uh, What uh, work have you done before, and how did you come to write this book? Sure. Um, I... I have sort of two lives, right? I have sort of my, my formal professional life uh, where I do speech writing and kind of narrative development for companies and universities and other folks. Um, and then I have this life where I write books, uh, sometimes, you know, ghostwriting, but also under my own name, I had done the sort of <laughs> sequence of books. I'm going to say it out loud. It's not going to make any sense to anybody. So I'm a little like self-conscious, but I started with a biography of Cato the Younger, who's an ancient right. Roman senator, um, who was Julius Caesar's arch nemesis. And uh, I was in my early 20s and I didn't know what I was doing, but I noticed that no one had done a book. And so I was like, wait, that seems really like people have done biographies of Cicero and Caesar. And like, no one has done one of Cato. That's crazy. This is an injustice that needs to be righted. Right. And so I worked with a friend of mine, a good friend from college named Rob. Uh, we did that. And then like our next collaboration, I had a friend send me a book called The Idea Factory. And th that same friend like attached a post-it that said, you know, there's no bi like solid narrative biography of Claude Shannon, uh, the founder of information theory. And I was like, oh my God, there absolutely should be. And why is this, you know, it's terrible. So we went off and like we pitched that and it, it, that worked well. Um, in the course of doing that what book- What was your background I, to, to, know, to know who Claude Shannon was and his importance? <laughs> he must've had some kind of technical background, right? You know, not really. Um, I I came in as a as a non engineer and non information theorist. I think that you know one thing did work in my favor, which is John Gertner's book, The Idea Factory, is quite is quite good. And Shannon is a sliver of that. And then when you kind of like find other books about Shannon, you know, they're not biographies. So the book, The Information, by James Glick, was was quite an exceptional book. Um, mm. But it wasn't a, a kind of soup to nuts, you know, birth to death biography. And I, I like, I'm just drawn to the form, right? So like, I just read a lot of biographies and I thought to myself, like someone with Shannon's mind in the same way that like an Einstein or a Feynman, right? Someone with that quality of mind must have like lived a life that's worth exploring in detail, but I was not an expert. That said, and this is like, I guess something I think about a lot, you know, you walk in with a lot of imposter syndrome when you're not an expert, but I had to explain things to my to myself, right? Like meaning or get other people to explain them to me and then sort of do the translation on the page to make them work for other people. And if I don't understand what information theory is, right? Or if I don't understand, you know, some of these electrical engineering concepts, how am I ever going to make it like intelligible for a reader, right? So in a way be like there there's like a, there's like a level of ignorance that you can't have, but just beyond that like initial level of ignorance, you're actually in a really yeah. good spot because you will have to find these things out and explain them to other people. But I had no no background. Um, I, I we you know we we <laughs> we actually. It's funny you're making me think about this. We had a lot of electrical engineering faculty like sit us down and like actually like put things on the chalkboard and like walk us through yeah. things. It was it was pretty intense. Yeah. So after after and that then, book, yeah. Yeah, you know, after that book, there was a, a brief departure. Actually, there's a project I haven't really spoken about, but I, I did a book, a coffee table book on. Um, there's this remarkable hundred year old carousel that's on the Brooklyn waterfront that many people are familiar with. It's called Jane's carousel. And I had a, a young daughter. I was taking her there all the time. I dropped Jane a line, just like a, a kind of a thank you note, but like, you know, a nice thank you note, like something that would be memorable. And we, we got to communicating and, and trading notes and letters and things. And then I, I, I was like, Jane, you should really do a book on the carousel. Like there needs Wait, to who's be Jane, one. Who's Jane again? Um, so her name is Jane Walentis. Uh, she, the late Jane Walentis, she passed away uh, in 2020. Um, but she was a remarkable person who spent 30 years hand restoring this carousel, uh, uh -huh. scraping down the horses to discover the original paint. She wanted to do a historically faithful restoration. Uh -huh. The only way I got pulled into this project was I had suggested it and then sort of got like, it became like what she called like lovingly, like the Jane and Jimmy show. Like we would go and like, try book. Like, what's the book it look like? And then we pitched it to, she pitched it to Fiden and Fiden was excited about it. And it became this amazing testimonial to her three decades of work, bringing this carousel back to life. And now it's like, you can't imagine the Brooklyn waterfront without it. Um, 
while doing that, I was working on this other project that you had read that we we're talking about today. I looked at Bell Labs when I was researching Shannon's life because Bell Labs in the 20th century is just this incredible cluster of talent. They win six Nobel prizes. They invent the transistor. They invent touch tone dialing, you know, like, and, and yeah. they warehouse just like some of the finest minds of the 20th century. I looked for other groups like that. And I could have like looked at Fairchild Semiconductor, General Magic, and then thought about PayPal. And PayPal was just another thing where like, I felt like there was like an empty space on a bookshelf and someone, someone really ought to go do this. And so yeah. I was like that, you know, let's just go do it. Yeah. And the, and the PayPal uh, thing, I mean, I don't think people, I think people, most people probably know uh, Peter Thiel was uh, associated with uh, uh, PayPal. So I did it. I mean, I didn't, I know Elon Musk, of course. I didn't know Elon Musk was part of PayPal until actually pretty recently. Um, and then Reed Hoffman too. So can you talk about, I mean, I think once you, t once you tell people who don't know, like who was involved with PayPal at the beginning, I think the, uh, you know, the necessity of the uh, story sort of becomes uh, self-evident. So can you just talk about sort of the character? Yeah, people involved. 100%. So it is this, uh, you know, this sort of incredible farm team for modern technology for the past 20 years, right? The, the, it, uh, the way I describe it in the book, and I, it's not an exaggeration, if you've touched the internet in the last 20 years, there's a 99% likelihood you've used a product or service built by one of the PayPal alumni. Um, people may watch this if you put this on YouTube. YouTube was created by PayPal alums. Uh, LinkedIn was created by Reid Hoffman and other, other PayPal alums. Uh, Tesla, SpaceX, obviously. Uh, Affirm, Palantir, the first money into uh, some of the earliest money into some of the most significant social networks came out of PayPal and its creators. Um, you know, you just go on down the line. I mean, you can point to a company in the Valley and it is tied in some way to the PayPal years. And I, to be honest, I didn't know really until I went sort of way deep how how much of an influence it had. Um, but yeah, the, the household names obviously are, you know, the Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, Reid Hoffman, uh, Max Levchin, David Sachs. But I would go even like go further, like it's all the unknown folks you don't, you know, you sort of aren't familiar with who are now in positions of real kind of like important consequence uh, at technology companies, at venture capital firms. That I write about in the in the in the opening sequence, like they're not done either. Like there's a a company called Terraformation that is trying to reforest three billion acres of forest. Um, there, you know, Kiva.org, which was a social enterprise, came out of the PayPal alumni group. Um, you know, there's there's ambassadors or advisors to governors, right? So there's a political, there's definitely a, a contingent that went into politics. It, it's across like society, like, you know, it's a sort of society wide effect. And if you think about the fact that this was a small company that wasn't certain its success was far from certain. That's a pretty remarkable thing. Yeah. And what was it like to research this book? So all these people are now very busy and very important. And the more busy and, you know, the bit more important they are, they get, the more busy, the busier they are. Uh, you know, how did you approach the, the issue and, you know, what kind of access were you able to get? Yeah. You know, it, um, it's funny. I'm like reflecting on it. I'm having a little bit of, I think like uh, sort of, uh, Reminiscing and a little bit of PTSD too, um, but uh, I I started at the top uh, just by design. I, I had reached out to I like here's if we're we're in we're in the like Richard and Jimmy's circle of trust plus your listeners, right? So uh, what I can say is I thought that it, that at some point someone would say no to me asking questions about these years. Uh, that's the candid. That's the truth. I thought that these people were high profile you know, powerful in every sense, like cultural clout, money, et cetera. And I, I basically had this, this thing in my head that I would say to myself a lot. I was like, just keep going until someone says no, and then we can move on to another project. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I went to Peter Thiel and I, I essentially, I did, you know, some version of a, of a pitch. I said, look, you had this remarkable team. They built this company. The company is still around today. That team proved to go and like do this again and again in different places. And I want to tell the story of what happened, but I don't want to do it just by talking to you and Max for a few hours and sort of making up a narrative, right? I would like to really do a historically faithful look at what happened and dive in. And but I don't want to like I'm not in a sort of uh, this isn't combat. Like if you don't if you're gonna like stop this or tell people no, there's no point to me doing it because I'll never get sources or material. And he kind of, and I, and my last little thing was, I was like, it's like Lord of the Rings, but just set in Silicon Valley in 1999. And he got really into that. And, um, 
And, and there was some truth to it. I was like, look, you have these disparate people who come together. There's a sort of mission. You, you know, uh, it's a very wide array of characters and you know some of them and you don't know others. Um, he, he said, sure, I'll like, I'll sit for it with you and I can make a couple introductions and, and that's great. And as soon as that rock got rolling down the hill, I just, uh, I just, I kind of, I, what's the, I, the right phrase ought to be, I was like, went for broke. So what I did was I assembled employee rosters uh, of every person that worked at the company over that period of time. And I would send multiple emails, yeah, polite emails, but I would like send out emails. I would cold email a lot of people. If there was someone of real importance where there was a friendship involved, I typically asked the person to make the introduction. So I asked, you know, Peter to introduce me to Max. Um, I asked uh, Ken Howery to introduce me to David Sachs. Um, you know, I asked Ken Howery to introduce me to Keith Raboy, on and on. I would, I would sort of never like ask one person for too much, but I would make like maybe one or two asks. And if they were polite enough to do it, you know, it would open the door to more discussions. You know, over the course of five years, I think I did 270-ish interviews. Mm. Um, and a lot of that was that, you know, you, we, we, we fell into the trap right from the beginning. There are all of these people that are today like household names on Twitter or household names like in actual households, right? Um, there's hundreds of people who built this company that never got real uh, uh, kind of attention, never got any recognition really. Um, and by the way, some of that is like they didn't want it, right? They were suspect of even speaking to somebody like me. But I, I... There was a part of me that just said, you know, there's this amazing roster of people and so many of them deserve like recognition. Like they, they ought to be recognized, right? Assuming they're comfortable with it. So I would talk to them. So I talked to, I talked to like the benefits administrator of the company. Um, I spoke to somebody who interned there for like two months and then left, mm -hmm. um, became a magician. Uh, he was a great interview because he did magic on screen with me while I was interviewing him. Yeah. Um, so I went out to actually really try to get yeses from as many people as I could. And my questions were actually almost always the same, you know, whether it was Elon or Peter or you know, whoever, um, it was always, what did, what were you doing right before you got to PayPal? Like what made you join this, this company? Uh, and so the, almost all the interviews sort of flowed in that direction. I think the reason, maybe there's a question behind your question, which is why did it work for me where it might not have worked in the past for other people? 20 years has gone by. And these people don't have the same emotional investment in this story, I think, as they once did. And what would happen is like they would start to reminisce and the stories would start to pour out. And we would almost always go over our allotted time because to think about this period in their life is much less stressful than thinking about whatever they're dealing with today. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, this is an important work of history. I mean, because if you think about who are we going to remember in a hundred years, I mean, I genuinely think we're going to probably remember Elon Musk or, or Peter Thiel more than uh, Joe Biden. Um, or, you know, honestly, I mean, if you think about the most important inventors from 100, 120 years ago, right, we care about Edison more than we care about Rutherford B. Hayes, right? Or Alexander yeah. Graham Bell, you know, compared to Chester Arthur. So I think we're going to remember, right. I think they'll remember Trump in 100 years. I think that story is too funny. And I think people will always, uh, I think people will always like sort of be referring to that. Like that was a very, very interesting time. Um, but, you know, we think about politics. Now you're going to, now you're going to make me, you're going to go make me look at the Chester Arthur Wikipedia page. The, <laughs> That's your next yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the forgotten president. Yeah. You should just do the a forgotten, book. The forgotten president. Someone needs to, there needs to be a Chester Arthur Renaissance yeah, now. Get, like we, the we're, five, we're overdue. Like, least, yeah. The five <laughs> least famous presidents. And then just like write a biography of them. Yeah. That would be, that would be cool. Uh, but, but, yeah, but absolutely. You see what I'm saying? I think Musk, you know, well, no offense to Biden, he's obviously important, but I think people will, will care about Elon Musk 100, 200 years uh, from now, a lot more than they care about him. Um, and, you know, it's, um, well, the, the speaking, I mean, speaking of like sort of the emotional reaction, my impression from the book is like, they're all pretty much, you know, I found very interesting. The time scale is very short. The time scale is like, you know, the, the thing just, uh, they merge, uh, Confinity and, um, X, they merge in 1999, right? Like middle of 1999. They merge in early 2000, actually. It's a, it's a yeah. sort of, the, the, the technical date is like March 31st, but the merger is largely finalized by the middle, middle February of 2000. Right. So it's a, I mean, it's a very short thing. Like PayPal like starts like in 1999, right? It yeah. merges with uh, X, which is uh, Elon's company um, in 2000. Yep. That's like the modern yep. PayPal. And then they're go, yep. they're fighting, um, they're fighting, they go the IPO. And then within, uh, by 2002, they're sold to eBay, right? So three yeah. years, every, the whole, the entire and, story. And really, me. really the, 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 the key pieces of it are two years, right? So it's basically two years from February of 2000 
to February of 2002 when they go public. And that's like like a lifetime's worth of experience happens in those two years, right? Yeah. Um, and by the way, and September 11th happens uh, smack in the middle of the of that period as well. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's a lot going on, uh, you know, historically and uh, uh, so on. Yeah. So like for somebody like me, like I'm used to reading, you know, about like, uh, you know, po- uh, politics, history, sort of people in government. And, you know, you hear about like they want to reform a system, you know, maybe it happens in 20, 30 years. Right. I was just impressed by uh, I was just impressed by the extent to which, you know, these people just got things done and there was no playbook. I mean, they were operating under, I mean, everything, like, it seems like everything was sort of like a questionable legality. Like, are they a bank? <laughs> like, are, you know, c- can they deal with like, uh, uh, you know, can they deal with, um, you know, gambling the, and these other things, you know, like, it seems like everything was sort of a legal gray zone and you just, I'm just amazed by sort of what people in business, I mean, have to the, the hoops they have to jump jump through, and then like how they're still able to just plow forward and and actually do stuff. I mean, was that something that sort of drew you to the story? Yeah, you know, it's a uh, it's what I would describe as like a propulsive energy, right? That that emerges in several places. It emerged in my interviews with the participants who spoke about just how brutally hard this experience was. There was an engineer who described to me. He said, you know. I was so sleep deprived that I totaled two cars driving home from yeah. the office back home. You had a long commute. Yeah. Well, and, Elon, Elon and, and uh, Peter almost, uh, almost, uh, they, they almost had a fatal crash, right? Right. That that was that, that wasn't was not, a, that, that was, was not a sleep exhaustion. Uh, yeah. that, was a sleep <laughs> that was different. That was just a car that's a lot to handle. Like the McLaren's an impressive piece of engineering, but right. it's a lot. To, it's a lot harder to drive than people think. Um, the the but the 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 level of like the the kind of kinetic energy in the place is palpable. I would say it was also palpable in the, like I had some, somebody had shared a bunch of emails and they shared these newsletters, like the weekly newsletters that were internal to the company. And you, you can get it when you read these documents. You're like, every week feels like everything's on the line, right? And that the next week could be the day that they, uh, that they go under. There's this website at the time, um, Pardon the French, but it, it was called fuckedcompany.com. And what it was doing was it was cataloging all of the like epic failures from the 2000s and the dot com bubble bursting. And I had an employee tell me they were they they were like every like, couple of days we would just like go on to fucked company to see if we were on there. Like we all sort of thought like eh, at some point that might happen to us, right? So it's it's a very like it's the whole company is a close shave and. I, I did, but I also found that like like you, it's sort of the success in spite of that. And then the success where everything is an unanswered question, meaning there's nothing that they could go and, and like Google, right? Like, like look up answers to X. Everything is having to be invented as they're facing it, which is a very different style of operating than any work I had seen. And I, obviously I came as an outsider here. I'm not of Silicon Valley. I don't work in a tech company. I think it would. This will feel natural to people who are in, like, let's say, besieged, underfunded startups right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's what this was. This was, you know, depending on your where you're measuring, two to four years of very intense building against many odds, against regulatory hurdles, against internal complicated dynamics, against technological limitations. You know, we were on dial-up internet back in the day, and I remember like having you know, games with friends interrupted because my parents needed to make a phone call, right? But they were running a business where that was a reality for them. They had to manage around that reality. So I, I, I'm i glad the, the the intensity of it came through because it's a huge part of the shaping experience of this. Yeah. And, um, you know, looking back, the people looking back, it seems that from my impression from the book was uh, Elon Musk looks back and says, you know, it could have been much bigger. He's sort of disappointed. The original vision was him was sort of to consolidate everyone's finances into one place. That was sort of the X, uh, X dream, um, X his company. Um, and everyone else seems like, you know, they, they, they did it and then they sort of moved on to other things. Did, did you get that? Uh, did you get the impression that Musk was sort of just unique in his sort of regret that it didn't go, it didn't go reach its full potential? You know, I think there were others who expressed the regret. Luke Nosick expressed the regret, actually, and he was on the other side. He was on the Confinity side, which is the company that creates the product PayPal that ends up like actually becoming the full company. Luke says, you know, at one point he says, if this was the revolution, would we have sold it? And he's he's a big believer in the idea that part of PayPal's abiding mission was to 
overthrow currencies to stop currency manipulation around the world. They had come, you know, we're, we're in the hangover during 1997, eight, nine of the uh, Asian financial crises. They had seen currencies like fluctuate like crazy. And part of Luke's, you know, impetus is like, well, that seems unfair for the people in those countries. Um, so there's a few other people that have the regret. I would say the regret is felt most profoundly by Elon. But to your, to your point, you know, it, he also went on to do other things, right? The, the, the other things that we know him for today. And I had multiple people tell me, they said, you know, and and he himself said, it's hard to argue with the eventual outcome, which was positive, yeah. <laughs> right? Which is sort of like understatement of the century in some sense. Um, but other people said, you know, it, this freed him to do electrical energy in cars and it freed him to do, you know, space transportation, logistics and exploration. And there's a, de- you know, he himself admitted to me in a sort of passing moment, he said, you know, that's, it's possible that if I hadn't been ousted or if the, things had gone differently, that I could still be there today, just like grinding away, trying to like make this vision a reality. Um, I, I, you know, in some sense, I suppose it's, it's, a, it's a good thing for the world that these entrepreneurs didn't just sort of stay with this company for, you know, three or three, two to three, three decades because you know we have so many things today that they built or did or achieved they've also built a template for not doing kind of one thing but going and doing it again right so the sort of repeat or serial entrepreneur um i, I that you know that they'd have a harder time if they were all still at paypal like you know turning a public company into like a slightly bigger public company i see so you think you think that idea of sort of serial entrepreneur somebody makes a big company then goes around and sort of sits on boards and becomes a venture capitalist you you think that that you think the people at paypal they sort of pioneered that model and we would we wouldn't even think of sort of entrepreneurs maybe in that in that sense if if that didn't happen oh i don't yeah i would let me let me add add a disclaimer because i'm not I don't know that I would go that far. You know, that, that model exists. It predates them, right? Meaning there are people who start multiple companies or ventures. I think that the difference is that there's a couple of things that come out of it. One is all of them have a healthy respect and admiration for the founding period of something. Like the, the, all of them at one point or another sort of meditated, like re- shared reflections about the, the idea of a founder, about this sort of what, what Peter Thiel has called the zero to one, but the idea of like actually scratching out something new in the world and that the person who does that is a creative force. Now, for my purposes, I expanded the definition of founders here to include people on the cover, the front cover and the back cover who didn't get their due, but who I regarded as like, just as like just as worthy of that title as anyone, but you know, I would say that it, it, it gave them a real respect and almost like a reverence for anyone who founds anything. Like meaning, like the act yeah. of creating something new is something to be celebrated by this group of people. I would say the other part of it is, you know, I had heard a friend speak about this uh, on a, on a different podcast. You know, they made this cool, <laughs> like yeah. like they made this sort of creativity, this kind of creation, something to aspire to, right? Um, I, I I have a young daughter and she we live on a on a block with other kids. And these two boys who live a few doors down from me speak about Elon Musk the way in the tones that I suspect people in the 50s and 60s spoke of yeah. like the first set of astronauts, yeah, right? Cool. And and yeah. I know there's cynicism in business, and I know there's reasons that people will be for or against different things he has said and done. But you cannot actually deny the, the the fact that like children know his name and see him as someone to aspire to. Um, I I hope that there's like a that there's room enough in American public life to celebrate that, and I think we ought to. But it suggests something about this group of entrepreneurs that's di- qualitatively different, let's say, than a than a um, you know than somebody you know from like like a Jack Welch. <laughs> Like, like, like Joey and Dan from next door are never going to like be like, I really want to be like Jack Welch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, do you think, I mean, there was so much talent concentrated there and it's like, you know, all, you know, and I'm just wondering when I'm reading it. So a lot of them come out of the university of Illinois, um, you know, mm-hmm. uh, um, uh, Max uh, Levchin and uh, Nozick comes from uh, uh, University of Illinois, right? And then one or two other guys. The YouTube, the YouTube founders do as well. Uh, two of two out of the three YouTube co-founders come from uh, the University of Illinois. Yeah, and that makes and the, Yelp, I mean, the, the Yelp founders actually, the Yelp co-founders mm-hmm. come from who are, who are PayPal alumni come from UIUC. 
Yeah. So, I mean, I was thinking like, you know, I'm sure it's a good program, but like, you know, how does the, you know, University of Illinois just produce like, you know, all the, you know, all these like brilliant people who go on and have such a mark on the world. Do you think it's just like, you know, it, it's just, it's just sort of, there was just a synergy there that, that worked because it's unlikely that like, you know, they happen to have the four or five, you know, best programmers or some of the best programmers right there, right. undergrads at the, the computer science program, there had to be a little more. So it had to be talent, but it also had to just be a timing thing and being at the right place and right time. And it has to be, I think, you know, probably there's maybe like a few people, like I think if, you know, uh, if, if, like a pressure from the book and, you know, I don't know anything, you, you, you probably, you would have a better idea of this. It was really Max was sort of the, the genius force and the driving and like the creative force that just, bringing the University of Illinois people, not saying that they, you know, they were not talented in their own right, but he was the one who really um, sort of was uh, the catalyst for everything that happened from there. Is, is that your idea? Or how do you think about sort of um, yeah. the role of talent and the role of just, you know, timing and synergy and all that, those other things? Right. No, this is a fun one to unpack on on several levels. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned the University of Illinois Champaign-Urana. It is one of the underrated components of this particular story, this generation of entrepreneurs, Um, And it's one of the things that uh, someone I interviewed very early said, look, everyone thinks of this as a Stanford story or as a West Coast story. They miss the fact that so much of our engineering talent actually came out of like the, you know, Champaign-Urbana. So I went back and like I, you know, went to the campus. I I looked through old historical documents that were published by the Department of Computer Science in the 90s. But if let's take UIUC, like stay on this beat for a second, because UIUC's contribution to computing like extends for decades, right? From the 40s, 50s, 60s. This is the combination of uh, war funding of of you know naval departments that are based there or other things that, you know that happen there. They build some of the world's first digital computers. They build some of the world's first social networks. So by the time young you know young immigrant Max Levchin arrives at UIUC, you know the pump is primed. Like this place has been a real generative center for computing. The other part of it is Mark Andreessen has built the Mosaic browser, has left UIUC, gone, built Netscape. It's gone public. He's on the cover of Time Magazine. And all of a sudden, all of these people have something of a roadmap. Like, hey, you know, I had someone tell me like, that guy was in the dorms. (laughs) he, he, he He ate burgers at that place. I, I eat burgers at that place too. Like yeah. what a remarkable thing. So you have this person who sets the, the course for what you could do with computer code. He is hugely successful and it's like the starting gun. And part of what happens is, you know, Jawad Kareem, who is the later co-founder of YouTube, early PayPal, explained to me, he said, I came to UIUC because of Mark Andreessen. Uh-huh. So you have a collection of talent. Now, part of what's happening is the money and the, the kind of, the, the company creation is happening on the West Coast. So before Max, several of the people who are early in this story as either board members or later employees move out to the West Coast and start to kind of, they join Netscape, right? Or they or they start to go to meetups or they join startups or they do whatever they're going to do. Max is one of those people. He leaves uh, and, and understandably the first people he calls because he can hire no one because the talent market is so tight. He calls his friends from University of Illinois Champaign Red and says, "Hey, we did a lot of coding projects. I you respect, admire you. Could you come out here?" A little bit of convincing later, that first seed group joins him there. It's a it's a natural pipeline driven not by any um, grand theories about recruiting. It's 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 actually just driven by the fact that like, no one else would work for them. So the internet is on fire. Are you going to go to work for like a better, much better funded startup, or are you going to go work with you know this guy Max who has a hundred thousand dollars from this guy Peter, right? Who maybe they have an idea around mobile security and payments. You're not going to do that. You're going to go work for Google, <laughs> right? You're going to go work for. In fact, I interviewed I interviewed this woman um, who was early at Confinity, which is the company that Peter and Max created, and she, you know, she she admitted herself. She's like, I, I wasn't a good fit for me. And the company that she leaves for is Google. And this is like early days of, uh, still relatively early days of Google. So I was, or my joke was like, well, I guess, it, I guess it all worked out. And she was like, yes, it did. <laughs> um, so, you know, they're, they're in an asymmetric sort of battle for talent at a time when anybody else can kind of outcompete them. And Max has friends and contacts at UIUC and they recruit heavily from, from the UIC. Your broader question is about, you know, sort of like the nature and nurture, like was it that they they had a bunch of smart people and that's why they were successful or did the place enable the success? And I, and I think like any of these stories, it is it ha- the answer is unsatisfying, which is like, it's a little bit of both, yeah. right? You do have um, people 
who come to join this company who other people in the story describe as geniuses and not geniuses in the like, like colloquial, like, oh, they're really smart sense, but geniuses yeah. in the like, no, they, they do, they're just brains work differently. They're faster. They're more talented. You also have an environment that is created in the company where there's a fear of being going bankrupt. The dot-com bubble is bursting. Uh, they have a successful product, but not really a, a sort of sense of how they're going to turn that into a successful business. And they have to do a lot to make that happen. So they, they're, they're surrounded by very bright bulbs. I mean, these are just very, very bright people. They also are in an environment that directs that intellectual talent on very specific problems and just goes from problem to problem over the course of four years. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, you touch on the uh, well. Uh, let me let me go back to the the genius question. Who who do people talk about? You know, in this in this group of people who are all probably technical. The defin- they meet the technical definition of genius, which is like Mensa, which is like top two percent of IQ. You know, they probably are, everyone in the book probably or almost everyone in your book meets that. Who do they talk about as sort of like really standing out when you when you talk to these people? I mean, uh, yeah, it would it would uh, we'd occupy the whole podcast just talking about it. The, there's the obvious ones that are the household names uh, who are frequently referred to, but with that with that um, uh, you know that label, there are there are others though. Uh, Max Levchin recruits a young engineer who later becomes a co-founder of Yelp. His name is Russ Simmons, and in my first discussion about it, Max said Russ is a genius level. He's a he's a genius level I, outlier IQ. He can solve anything you want him to solve in half the time it would take someone else. Yeah. And he described this moment to me. He said, "You know, one time there was some uh, like there. This was a culture where puzzles were celebrated, like kind of like math puzzles yeah. and chess and logic problems." And I guess so they were standing around and someone had tossed out like a puzzle just casually in the air. And Russ was over, had overheard it, turned around and said, oh, the answer to that is such as that. And Max was blown away because he had he thought it would take a little bit of time. So he he asked Russ, I think I have the story right. He asked Russ, he said, you've heard that one before. That's how you knew the answer. And Russ said, no, it's just it's just easy. You just do this and this. And that's how yeah. you find the answer. And I had story after story like this where it was the way people described it, it was like almost an an a spooky level of that kind of intelligence, right? Um, I also saw it vividly. I was one of my, you know, key, one of my sources for this was Max and Max has a photographic memory. I didn't necessarily believe that until he would say things. And then I would find a piece of paper like months later that Uh sort of like chapter and verse had exactly what he had said. Um, Peter is a chess uh, grandmaster, like a national champion. He was one of the most talented players under 13 at one point. Um, Elon is obviously Elon. I mean, he had, there's a, a story about him having read every book in the library. And then when he ran out of books to read, he started to read the encyclopedia Britannica. Yeah. Um, I found actually in the buried archives of the daily Pennsylvanian, this isn't in the book. This is like a random aside. Uh-huh. You know how at that, when you graduate college, your parents can buy like an ad that just like congratulates you for graduating college. Sure. May Musk, Elon's mother had lovingly purchased an advertisement in the Daily Pennsylvanian or whatever it was called, the University of Pennsylvania student newspaper. And it's a little picture of Elon when he's like six or seven years old. And, it, you know, congratulations, Elon. And it said something to the effect of like, you're the best. Thank you for being the best son and an encyclopedia. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, which is like a, a kind of amazing thing. On down the line, though, even the engineers who, let's say, came in as junior level or mid-level engineers, they were they were very sharp. And there was a line in the book that, that someone had relayed to, that Max had said to them, A's hire A's, B's hire C's. And so the first B you hire will take the whole company down. Yeah. Right. And I, I suspect he was exaggerating for intended effect, but it shows you a window into the, the very high bar for intellect at a place like this. Um, it was, I, I mean, I, it, I, I would be lying if I said I wasn't intimidated during many of these interviews. These people can remember to this day, like specific graphs and math uh, solutions to problems that they faced 20 years ago. I mean, this is yeah. not, this is a, definitely an outlier group. Yeah, that, that, that's incredible. Um, the end, you, you touched earlier on the sort of the iterative process of the of the whole thing. I mean, they started out, uh, Cofinity, which was uh, the precursor to PayPal, started out as a thing that was going to take Palm Pilots. Young people don't even know what probably Palm Pilots I barely know what Palm Pilots are. I know Blackberries. <laughs> it's basically like a Blackberry, right? It's like a little thing you it's hold. Like a pr- it's like a predecessor to a Blackberry. I think Blackberry was developed after. But yeah, it's the one of the first... Uh, it's not one of the first, it's one of the first commercially successful uh, PDAs, uh, th- these devices that were supposed to sort of organize your life, do email, do all the things that iPhones can do today. 
Uh, but the Palm Pilot was one of the first truly successful mass market products. And yeah, and all they wanted was a Palm Pilot. They could transfer money to another Palm Pilot. So I'd have to stand next to you. I would have one, and we'd split the you know we'd split the check at dinner. Uh, yeah. But and then the email thing, you know, sending money through email is just sort of comes by by accident. Can you talk about sort of just how that? Because that's an incredible. I mean, that's just an incredible sort of uh, history of how the company came to be. Yeah, it's it's one of my favorite things in the whole story because I think there's a real temptation when you're writing about a group that is this successful, especially later in life and in 2022, to assume like they just have it all figured out. You, In fact, you could actually even make the assumption like, oh, they're just really smart and smart people can figure it out. It, that sort of couldn't be further from the truth. Like The development of this company and many companies like it is a wildly iterative process. And you described it exactly right. They, the original inaugural PayPal product was a product by which Richard and Jimmy could beam money to each other through the infrared port on our Palm Pilot, which was notoriously glitchy and really low powered. But the idea was, wow, this is a new thing in the world. I can now have a use case for this IR port, the infrared port, and we can beam money. Great. How exciting is that? As many of their advisors uh, and several employees point out, you know, there's a ceiling on the success of a product like that because not everyone has a Palm Pilot and the infrared port is really glitchy, and you have to sync to a desktop computer. So you're not actually beaming money. You're just beaming like some kind of future promise of payment. And so Max Levchin, in response to these justified frustrations, says, well, why don't we just do this? You, we'll create an email companion product so that I can email Richard the money, and then he can accept it by email. And his view at, at the time was no one's going to use this. Like the Palm Pilots, the fun, new, exciting, technologically incredible thing. So we're going to, but email, we'll put it, we'll stick it in the site. It'll be there. Say, you know, life will go on. Um, that product takes off. It takes off for a variety of reasons, uh, with the biggest being that, that the auction website eBay had not yet rationalized it, its payments process and emailing money, $10 and $20 payments, was, a, was if they built an effective technology and it was simple, and it was easy to use, and email had proliferated. So this is the year after the movie You've Got Mail with um, uh, Meg Ryan debuts, right? Um, and Tom Hanks, I think, I don't know who it was. In any case, the mo- movie Hanks, You've Got yeah. Mail, de- yeah, that, that movie debuts, everyone has an email address at this point. So you have ubiquity for the, for the underlying kind of like infrastructure of that person-to-person payments mechanism. But but it's most definitely the afterthought product. And there is a lot of there are a lot of clashes about, you know, people like, well, this isn't the, the you know, spiffy tech thing that we set out to build. This is just like emailing money. Like and, and there are people like David Sachs who say, look, we have product market fit here. We have people who want to use our product to email money. We need to lean into this. And they lean into it very aggressively. Virtually the same thing happens over at X.com with Elon's companies except that the that his product suite is broader. So he's got a bunch of different kinds of financial services products. Emailing money happens to be one of them and it similarly takes off, but it just goes to show you this was not there was no roadmap, no grand plan. This was they built something, it was a good product, it took off and then they nurtured and uh and drove that growth over the next several years. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's interesting. It seems like David it seems like David Sachs was, you know, really it seems like he was like pivotal in a lot of uh, you know, a lot of like are we going to go this way or that way? And he was almost it seems like he was right almost almost often almost always, right? He was pushing the email thing. I think he was uh, you know, the later uh, negotiations with uh eBay. He he seemed to have like uh, the simplicity. His focus, he comes in and he says, you know, this is too complicated, just keep make it user friendly. He just seemed to just have like a really good knack for like what the market wanted and like what could be, you know, what was practical and feasible. Um, that, that's right. And every, by the way, I would say like, that's actually a critical role that's often overlooked is the person who's asking the question, what are users actually using this for? <laughs> you yeah. know, like what, are, what are the actual human beings who we intend to use our products doing with our products? Um, he does that. And, and it's a hugely important role. It's also not an easy role to play. Because you're often the person saying no. He says to me, he said, you know, I often became like Dr. No in the company. Like I had to say no to everything we were building that was exciting that, that had no purpose, right? Because we couldn't have, you, you needed to cut everything that was extraneous and focus on the thing that was successful. Yeah. And it seems like sort of Teal and uh, Musk, they were sort of, they were more sort of visionaries. You, you mentioned at some point that uh, there's a philosopher that uh, Peter Teal likes named uh, Rene Garrard, right? Um, and he sees humans as a mimetic machines, but in the sense that humans look at 
to other humans to decide what they want. Now that's sort of like a not, that's like sort of the opposite perspective. It's like, we're going to tell people, you know, what they want. We're going to lead them in a certain direction. And it seemed like uh, Elon with, uh, with uh, X was sort of the same thing. Like the market was giving him certain signals, but he was like, no, we're going to, you know, we're going to consolidate all your finances into, into one place. So you sort of have this sort of a uh, nice mix of like visionaries and like practical people. Um, that you know, and, see- and by the way, yeah, go ahead. I, I think that 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 it's it's an it's one of the most interesting, least understood, and complex parts of these startups is that there is there is always a tension between vision and practicality, between the story of what you're doing and what the hard reality is on the ground, right? And so you you I, I had a few people tell me they said you know what what Elon was exceptional at was actually outlining what the future of finance would look like, right? In very specific terms down to the mainframe level, like what databases needed to be upgraded, right? That, that, that was powerful. It would draw people in. It drew recruits in. Recruits would listen to him talk and like, sign me up, right? Like, like let's go. Um, the other part of it is you, you do need people who, and I would say there are two individuals who I really, uh, got to understand their contributions to the company. One is Amy, Amy Rowe Clement, uh-huh. uh, and the other is David Sachs, and they're both on the product team. And, and they, along with the other members of the product team, you know, you have to take that and, and translate it into something that is going to work, that's going to work in multiple currencies, that's going to work across time zones, it's going to work when the website is down, that's not going to lose people money, that's not going to get defrauded, right? So it's part of why the book has more... Like, if you were to just interview the, the sort of, like, let's say, just... Um, Reed Hoffman and Peter Thiel and Elon Musk, you actually wouldn't get the richness of this story. You you have to dive in. I actually, the way I dove in was I looked at customer complaints. So I, I read like thousands of pages of customer complaints to find the ones that, that sort of stood out to me. And it made me realize like they were actually managing, you know, the success of a product, but an unintended success has like unintended consequences. And the unintended consequences were people were really mad when they couldn't get their money. And then the company would have to race to solve that problem. And so I think there, but I like that you point out, like there's this balance between the, the, the vision and the, the, the hard reality. And that's, I, I don't have any kind of like conclusions about it per se, but I think yeah. both are vital and both, you know, they find expression in PayPal. Yeah. I mean, the idealism that you talk about in the book and you've touched on here, I mean, is very interesting because so often they would be like, oh, you know, so they would try to recruit somebody and that person would be like, I have this, you know, safer, maybe more, even more financially lucrative offer from somewhere else. And it's like, no, you're going to build something. You're going to do something very, very cool. And like people are like, people would be sold on that. Um, And, you know, it's like, it's sort of easy, you know, like, so to be idealistic, like, okay, so I've used PayPal and, you know, you've probably used PayPal and a lot of people who've uh, listened to this have used PayPal. We don't see it as like some romantic thing usually, right. right? We push a button and money goes from, you know, A to B. It's not like, you know, you can see how SpaceX would, you know, capture the uh, imagination of, of little kids. Uh, but, you know, PayPal, we don't really see it like that. But it, I mean, it, it is... It is. There is something to get excited about. I mean, objectively, I mean, it, it you know made people able to you know send money around and made people able to uh, you know start their own businesses. A lot of it, you know, seems like you know thousands or you know whatever uh, tens of thousands of business would wouldn't have been viable without without PayPal. A lot of people would have had less you know connection. It, it, you know, it was it was important. I mean, for you know, mil- touched millions and millions of lives. Um, but you know, it's not it's not naturally something people get idealistic about. But it seems like these the people involved in PayPal, maybe the people in the Valley more generally, could sort of see ideal and romance and beauty in things that other people couldn't as easily. Does that make sense? It does, in, and it's it's certainly a part of it. it makes me, you know, it, it. I like the way you put it. I, I had two two thoughts. The first is um, the romance was for many of the people who joined. It was, the romance was in the other people who were already at the company. Yeah. And so what would happen is they would meet someone and I had several, this happened several times, like someone, I would describe how they got to the company and they said, well, you know, I stopped by the office <laughs> and, and I wasn't exactly sold on this whole Palm Pilot thing, but I met the team and the team was, you know, intense and they had all these ideas and there was so much energy there and they were there at all hours. And I, I had, you know, two people, there are two moments in the book that where I get to say, these are my people, right? Uh, Denise Aptekar, this member of the product team, she said, I, you know, I wasn't sold on the product vision, but these are my people like this. They're clearly like they want to work hard. They want to do things in the world. So 
the, the romance was in actually the, the team dynamic. I would say there were a subset of people who were recruited by the revolution in finance big vision. Um, but that vision, you know, it sort of dissipates as the as the company becomes a, a person-to-person payments mechanism with all of the, you know, like you said, like John F. Kennedy's not gonna give stirring speeches about person-to-person payments, <laughs> right? Um, but the the the, in, the intelligence in the room, the problem solving instinct in the room, the love of puzzles, the belief that they were doing something big and important, uh, all of that did drive recruiting and it did drive the ability to actually build this team. And so I don't, you know, I don't think we can discount it. Um, it, it you, you have to be careful that it doesn't become one of these like, you know, from the show Silicon Valley, like one of these like cliches or jokes, but th- their ability to sell that vision is part of what makes them, it allows them to recruit some of the most exceptional people in the world. And when you don't have, you know, actual stock when you don't have big fat salaries when you don't when your company's under siege all the time like you are going to sell this david versus goliath story right uh one of max levchin's favorite films is kurosawa's seven samurai and he watched he's watched it over a hundred times and he calls it his like sole source of management training before paypal and i get the feeling that they tried to project an image in which they were a small band right like kind of fighting the elements uh in the same in the small group of samurai that is what attracts people and and leaves leads people to, to leave other jobs to join them. Yeah, yeah, right. So yeah, so it's it's sort of a there's a draw. There's these these are just leaders. I mean, and they're they're drawing people in, and people want to be, uh, you know, around that sort of idealism, and they want to be around that energy. I mean, it was also you know sort of a, it was a sort of instructive on on human nature, sort of the, the tribal aspect of it, right? I you know I like when like they you know they're like oh we got to kill eBay, like eBay is like you know their enemy, and you know they're they're just like you know they they it's like you know it's like some kind of you know just tribal thing, and then like they get bought by. Uh, you know, they get bought by eBay eventually. And then they're like, you know, they're sort of like, uh, they're, they're just, they're, they're seething. They're like, they form the PayPal click and they like, uh, they mutilate like the dolls, the mongoose dolls that the, uh, the eBay gives them. Right. And so you see this human yeah. nature too. It's like people don't even need, like, they don't even need a, a like a, a reason, right? It, like, even if, even, right. if, even if there was no idealistic, you know, message at all, it's just people like winning and they like forming tribes and they like fighting. That's why they go to, you know, sporting events and, you know, they, uh, you know, this is, this is nationalism. I mean, this is just something, you know, deep in human nature. And, you know, that really comes through in the book too. Yeah. It's, it's a big part of it, although it, it's productive. So sure, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's productively tribal, let's call it. Right. And here's, here's how, um, there was a, it's not in the book, but I interviewed this wonderful uh, designer named George Ishii, and he shared with me a reflection. He said, you know, we had so many outward battles that it kept the internal battles like to a, a manageable minimum. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a design, the head of design and UX at PayPal, Sky Lee, uh, said, nothing brings a company together like having a mortal enemy. Um, and so in a way, like, there was a tribal quality. And by the way, like there were definitely fights within the company. I document some of that. It wasn't some like, you know, happy United team at all times. It was a lot of, it was a pressurized place, but there was so much external pressure and so much risk of failure. The team would sort of like, they would, they would activate on whenever a problem happened, they'd fix it or fight the opponent to, you know, as needed. So the, it was a productively tribal relationship with some of these outside entities because they felt like they were doing something that it had a sort of quasi existential quality to it. Yeah. And, you know, when I, when I think about, when I think about the the message and when I read about sort of what people were thinking at the beginning of PayPal, and I think about, you know, Elon's vision for uh, X and the, the Cofinity vision, it just it gave me deja vu when I read, when I uh, listen to the crypto people today, when they talk about sending money, you know, cross borders without, uh, uh, you know, without any, uh, you know, without any interference from government, it sort of has this libertarian sort of emancipatory, you know, helping people in, in the developing world, uh, you know, th- this vision. Um seems like the dream the dream is still alive it's just sort of shifted to something oh, yeah. people think can be you know even more revolutionary um but it, it's a, it's the same idea right the, those barriers haven't gone away um they're still there and there still seems like a lot of work to do yeah and you know i would say that it's it's a, it's one of the I'm, I'm glad you picked up on it it's a very perceptive read um there are echoes of all of the messages from you know those days from these people in the writings and tweets and minds and hearts of all of the crypto people, there is a, I would say at the practical level, you know, 
Elon has a very well-formed critique about the databases and infrastructure that underlie a lot of banking and government finance, that the code is old, that the computers like don't have good security. Um, he maintains that the criticism is still true. Those things haven't necessarily been upgraded. Um, these, the, even the ACH technology that a lot of us use to get our paychecks was developed in like the 1970s, right? Um, and so you have like the fundamental critique hasn't gone away. Uh, some of the messaging obviously has found its way into crypto and other other ventures. Um, I would also say that the um, this sense that the thing to do is to not like try to persuade some other established entity to upgrade itself, but instead to try to come in and like just rewrite the script, right? That's an abo- That's a part of this place. It's a part of what makes Silicon Valley what it is, is, is really a sort of like fundamental thing that says, you've been doing this wrong. I, I and we can do it better and I'm just going to go create it and it will, yeah. it will be better, right? There is something about that, that this isn't a day job. You know, it's like, it's not nor- that's like a thing that we ought to like look at with, like to, to look at it from the outside in, it's not that someone's signing up for a nine to five. What they feel like in many cases they're signing up for is a mission, mm-hmm. right? Uh, which is a different orientation to a job than someone who says, this is my paycheck, right? Um, and and I, I think there's, I mean, I think there's something powerful in that. I think there's something, there's a certain romance about it. It also makes entrepreneurship something more than just the kind of accretion of, of just like kind of personal wealth, right? Like Like many of these people, particularly the people at the top, like this is what they do. Their orientation to the world is to be usefully irritated, find problems to solve so, and solve them. Mm. It, it's really not so much around like retirement money because many of them have had that for a long time and they could have retired a long time ago, but they keep at this particular enterprise, right? Uh, yeah. It's a kind of interesting, like it, it's an it's a interesting way to think about it. Yeah. I mean, they have, yeah, they, right. They, I mean, Elon, his first company he sold for that was the, like, it was like a thing that made maps online and he, he was, he had enough money to retire right there. He was in his, uh, yeah. what, like early twenties, uh, mid twenties, something yep. like that. And he bet, and he bet almost all of it in, on yeah. his next venture, X.com, yeah. which yeah. is a pattern of his. Um, but yeah, it, so it is, so it is this, it's a very, it's not what we think of from the outside in, um, and, and I do think that like, obviously like the crypto people have, have embraced some of this, not embraced other parts of it. I don't know that world nor write about it well or often enough to, to give it, do it justice. What I can tell you is that the idea of finance being this like uh, Goliath figure is definitely in the water then and it's in the water now. Yeah. And yeah, the, the finance and then sort of, I think, I think government, I think there's a sort of, you know, yeah. sort of like governments and borders and all this stuff, you know, that, that I see the connection between early PayPal and, and crypto. I, you know, I think there's a, a story in the book too, about sort of institutions and how they become stagnant, mm-hmm. right? So uh, eBay takes off way before PayPal. And it seems like eBay, you know, was pretty scrappy at the beginning. I mean, I think you tell the story of uh, uh, them getting like their, like people would be mailing them like change like as they're you know their fees people would just mail it by like hand right and so it's like this nimble thing and then by the time ebay swallows paypal it seems like a you know they they when they when the people paypal go there it's, it seems like they're miserable because it's all powerpoints and meetings and bureaucracy and you know they're like you know this is completely something different and i don't i don't think that would have been like ebay in 1998 you know i think ebay in 1998 would have been a completely different thing so it's sort of a, it's a lesson how like you know you can build something and you can change the world and then like institutions just sort of stagnate i mean they all become this homogenous you know boring corporate thing one of them says at some point about ebay it's like it's like something out of office space, right? It sort of becomes <laughs> becomes like that after a while, and you yeah. sort of you need that creative destruction, I, I guess, to just move, keep moving people forward. You do, and you know, it's it's interesting. I, two, two two thoughts on it. The first is, you know, that was the recollection of a number of people about the eBay, uh, the eBay period, the acquisition period. But it wasn't everyone. Many people joined eBay, like had a fine three to whatever year stretch there, ten year stretch. Uh, you know, left and went on to do like other things. Right. Um, and so it wasn't, it was, there was a critique, but I think maybe the, the critique got overplayed a little bit, right. Mm. In the writings after, and like, it made it seem like it was this stodgy place. The other thing, the other thing, and this is like, kind of like, you know, you wonder who gets the last laugh in all of this. Acquiring PayPal was one of the best financial moves eBay (laughs) eBay made. I mean, they made a very healthy return on their investment when eBay went public again, uh, when PayPal went public again in 2015, and they spun them out, right? And so it was the case that, you know, it was a smart, uh, uh, from eBay's perspective, here's what they saw. 
PayPal was underwriting a ton of financial risk and a ton of fraud risk. Why would eBay, which is in the auction services business, ever do that? Like, that's just like, it's a snake pit. We can let PayPal do that and either they'll succeed and we can buy them or they'll fail and we, we'll have known that our thesis about avoiding this kind of financial fraud was right. And so, you know, you sort of, you can, you can turn the map around and look at it from eBay's perspective and say, we're not going to get into this financial services, fraud risk, Russian fraudsters attacking us. And that's just, like, there's no need. We have a very healthy business doing this thing. That does, you know, there, there's also the other part of your thesis, which is big institutions tend to stagnate. I, I would imagine other people have, I'm sure, have written on this, but the great challenge of a, of a big company is how it continues to willingly disrupt itself right in this way. And I'm not knowledgeable on this. But looking at it from the 1998 to 2002 lens, it's mo most interesting to me was the critique of the banks who had the capital to build something like PayPal, yeah. who had the resources, the reach, the trust with, with users and didn't, right? And so in an interesting way, the, the, the more salient critique is like the financial services industry totally missed this. And there's yeah. actually really vivid quotes in the middle of the book from bankers saying, like, we totally missed this. <laughs> Like these guys kind of came through and swept in and did did what we should have done. Um, I, I don't know how one would run a company at that scale and continue to be the kind of place that an early stage PayPal or an early stage eBay was. It's quite possible that you just can't do it. Yeah. You know, uh, the one of the most uh, striking parts of the book is in the epilogue where you talk about these um, these guys in uh, prison. So there, there's this, uh, two guys. I think one is a black guy and one is a white guy, right? And they both- No, have, they're both black. Oh, they're both, they're both black? black? Okay. Uh, yeah. And they, uh, um, they uh, yeah, what, I mean, they, one of them grew up in a really bad area, but one of them had like, a, you know, a, a nice family life, and right? But that, 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 that part's right. And mm -hmm. they both killed some, mm -hmm. uh, ki one of them killed two people, right? And one of them killed one person. Mm -hmm. They were convicted as adults. They were sentenced to life in prison, both of them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this was outside of, the, around Baltimore, right? And then- yes. um, and then they be, they become obsessed with um, the you know the PayPal mafia, and they sort of start you know dreaming of a better life. Could you could you talk about this because this was very interesting? Yeah, it's one of the most surprising things I found in the course of my writing and, and research. Um, you know, you tend to think of these stories as like okay, like this is a traditionally technological story. You know, there's maybe some inspiration in some of the things they've done later. But it's like you said, it's PayPal. We're mailing, we're, we're sending money to each other. This is not, you know, it's not sending rockets to, to outer space. Um, in 2007, Fortune magazine runs a story called The PayPal Mafia. This is a controversial label. It's a controversial cover because there's only a handful of people on the cover of this magazine, but there are several hundred people who bring this company to life. It's not a universally beloved uh, tagline for this group. Uh, and I, I argue in the book, that it, it actually portrays the group as far more homogeneous than it was. And I think it's like an important disclaimer because this version of this history has been repeated and it's kind of, kind of cemented in people's minds, but it's, it's not, that photo doesn't speak to PayPal. It speaks to everything that happened after PayPal. Huh. So, but, but the, the story and the cover, the, the fortune magazine issue end up inside the Patuxent institution, which is in Jessup, Maryland. It's a maximum security facility. And it falls into the hands of two gentlemen, Chris Wilson and Stephen Edwards. And Stephen reads it, hands it to Chris and says, you have to read this article. They clip the, the cover and put it up on their prison wall. And for them, it represents a realistic, plausible path to success and excellence after they get out of prison. And what they start to do is collect every article they can on the people we know today, right? The people who are in the news, the, 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 the Musks and the Hoffmans, et cetera. And they assemble a packet of like everything PayPal related and everything like LinkedIn related and, you know, all the rest. And they teach a course inside the prison about the achievements and the lives of these people. And at first I was sort of like, no, like this, no, that just doesn't, it doesn't pass the smell test. But when I spent more time with Stephen and Chris, both of whom left prison later, they said, look, you know, we, we wanted an example of a positive network, a network that wasn't a gang. So that was one big thing in the photo and the, uh, the, the story. The second is business, as the way Stephen explained it, is when you get out of prison, business is one of the only places in American life where if you build your own business, there's no ceiling imposed on your success. Right. In every other job you apply for or line of work, you're hemmed in. You're, you're you know you're gonna you're gonna come up on a background check. Or you're gonna have to someone's gonna find your prison record, and all of a sudden you're not you know you're not in contention for certain things. 
entrepreneurship doesn't have that. If you build good products and services, people will buy them. Both Chris and Steven actually have built businesses now. Um, and in fact, Steven is a software entrepreneur uh, mm-hmm. and has patents that he's filed and, and received. Um, the last thing is they identified with the fact that the majority of the, so not the majority, but many in the early group, the majority of the early co-founders of both companies were immigrants. So they started with nothing. Right. So it's sort of like, yes, you can look at Elon today, but one must look, I think, at Elon when he arrives in the United States without much uh, and starts this life for himself. The same is true for Max. The same is true for Luke Nosik and many others. And so they identified, you know, these two young men in a prison identified with having nothing because they had nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and so so they, they become not just, by the way, not just like a mild inspiration. They become obsessed with the PayPal story. And I thought about how uh, how much it was just such a better and more interesting way to end this than anything I could have done because there were plenty of references to PayPal everywhere, right? But to find it in a maximum security prison in Jessup, Maryland was, uh, was I wanted to, I wanted to throw readers for a loop. Yeah. I, you know, it's a little bit, it was a little bit, the story, I mean, is, is, is interesting and it's inspiring. I, when I read the story though, it was like both of them sort of, the murder sort of sounded like, you know, that's not justified, like, you know, at least like, you know, it wasn't, you know, it was something where, you know, they were feeling threatened and it like made sense. How much did like, did you like, how much research did you do into this? Because I was like, is this, the, is this the full story about how the guys ended up, you know, where they are? Yeah, I actually went pretty deep just because again, this is like one of those, you have to really kick the tires on it. And yeah. Chris and I spoke at length about it. Stephen and I did as well. You know, in Chris's case, you know, he's approached by two men in an alley and, and the context is important here. This is Baltimore and Washington, D.C. at the height of the crack epidemic. Uh-huh. You know, Chris recalls walking over bodies in the streets. He had people he knew who were murdered. He attended many funerals by the time he was nine and 10 years old. He actually told me this vivid story. I don't know if it's in the book. He would he would sleep underneath his bed as opposed to on his bed because the bed was like eye level with windows. And if a stray bullet came yeah, in, you it was said, more you likely said to sleep on him. the floor. Yeah. Yeah, he would sleep. Yeah, yeah. And, and and so there's a context here in which there's a reason why a Chris Wilson at that moment would carry a firearm. Right. And one could argue there was a reason why a Chris Wilson approached by two men who look menacing in an alley at night would want to shoot before they shoot him. Yeah. Right. I didn't want to relitigate the crimes, okay, yeah, but I did, did go and, and establish and try to understand what happened. And, and I, I suppose like that's the best I could do given that like my focus was on, on everything else. Chris has told his story and he's told it in pretty vivid detail in a book called the master plan, which was about getting out of prison. Um, I wasn't there to, I was there to understand their interest in entrepreneurship, not so much to sort of go through chapter and verse what happened with the crimes. Gotcha. And then, uh, Steven, it, it was, it was sounded more like that was like a, um, it was a less case for self-defense it's not the focus i mean it's still like it's still a great story but you know whenever i read these stories yeah. you know i just have a skeptical like oh yeah okay yeah uh, oh no hey i was i'm right there with you i was as skeptical yeah. as they came because i didn't believe that any of it could happen like for my my first question was well there's no way because how would you have gotten the the magazines and the news clippings and the answer was steven's family had purchased the subscriptions and was able to give him a consistent yeah. set of business magazines like inc and entrepreneur and fast no, company it's, it's, and they would just they would clip they would just do clippings. So it sort of reminds me of like, you know, the PayPal mafia. You talk about like the, the you know, this framing, it came from a, a Fortune magazine article in 2007 and a photo shoot in there. And it reminded me and like how the people in prison, like so the guys in prison were sort of uh, inspired by this. And it sort of reminds me like if you're like trying to introduce like a new religion or new idea, and like say you're dealing with like a Christian population, you put in the language of like Christianity, right? Or you say it as like mm-hmm. a spinoff of Christianity. So, you know, something like that. And it's like these people understand the world of like gangs and hustling and making money. And like, you know, just calling it a mafia and giving them that picture. Like if they, if they just, if they just like the photo shoot was just like a bunch of guys in, you know, uh, a corporate office and like wearing suits. And then like you talk about like the lack of gender diversity and that got criticized. But let's say there's, you know, women, women there too. And like maybe these guys in like jail, they can't relate to it as much. It, maybe it doesn't inspire in, in the, in the same way. It's sort of a, um, you know, there's sort of a lesson like, you know, there's so many broader lessons from the book. It's like you reach people where they are and you reach them in their own language. Um, and. and- you, and you described that. almost, you described, you captured almost exactly what Chris Wilson said to me when I asked him about the image specifically. He said, the Godfather movies are inspiring. And, and the Godfather movies, he said they would play them in prison. 
And he said, and, you know, within my community, these movies, like we, we knew the icon, we knew the mafia motif. We knew that it was a part of our cultural like lexicon. Yeah. So when we saw like the nerdy tech crowd, right, these sort of billionaire entrepreneur types dressed up as mafiosos, he said almost word for word, it meant more to me than if they had done the photo in a more traditional fashion. Yeah. And so while I have, I think, and others have, uh, misgivings about some of the misrepresentation in that image. I also didn't want to deny the power and effect for someone like Chris, because as you said, if it was cubicles and hoodies, it's unlikely that it would have caught his eye in the same way, no matter who was on the cover, by the way. Um, it was much more, he said, you know, he said, he's like, I remember seeing it and thinking how cool this was. And it was cool in the way I knew what cool was. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, you're right. They reached them where they were at and where they were at was a like again, a life, a lifelong prison sentence in a in a in a maximum security facility. Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, it's funny. So I'll I'll tell you as a, as a thing I haven't shared until now. We're actually trying to do the book launch in the Patuxent Institution. So on the twenty second, uh, Chris and I are going to go like speak. Try I mean, we're still not confirmed yet, but try to speak to the prisoners and share this story. Uh, and you know, again, because the themes aren't any less true today than they were then, but we thought it would be a nice way to, to sort of bring things full circle. Yeah. Well, interesting. Yeah. By the time this comes out, you know, that will either, I guess have happened or not. <laughs> <So we> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, uh, well, 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 let me ask you this question. Why did you, um, I like, when I read about people, I like to know what they look like. So sometimes if there was a person I didn't know, mm -hmm. I would stop and then I would Google their name and often I couldn't find them because they weren't, uh, they weren't famous enough. Uh, but there was, there's no pictures in the book, right? There are pictures in the hardcover version of the book. There okay. is a photo insert. Oh, okay. Um, I, it wasn't. And, well, yeah. Well, and, I, and I think I, yeah, I hope they put it in the, uh, the most up-to-date digital version. I did have photos. I wanted to have photos. Uh, there was a part of this project that was a bit like a scrapbook, right? Because I, 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 I wrote, I wrote like 470,000 ish words, right? And what the final draft is like 160 ish thousand. And so there's a lot of stuff that like just didn't pass muster for me editorially, but there was a scrapbook quality. It would have been without photos. I, I think I would have done a real disservice to the project, mm -hmm. especially because the photos are really good. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I got a PDF, and you know, maybe I did. Maybe I didn't go all the way. Let me see. Are they in the back? No, I did. I just, think they might be in the middle, but if they're not, I can send them to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd, I have the. Yeah. I have the. Uh, yeah. There's no photos in here, so yeah. I wish I had them while I was reading, but yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to see them because that's so. Yeah. Something that. Uh, Something's interesting. I mean, what people look like is important. Yeah. I mean, Peter himself has talked about this. Like, you know, maybe we don't pay, we don't pay enough attention to. You'll also, see, it's not, and it's also not just the people. I have a, I have a screenshot of the original Palm Pilot application. Oh, yes. like as viewed like on a Palm that. Pilot screen. Yeah, and it says like, do you want to pay Jane Doe one dollar or whatever? Um, so it's, it, it was important for me to also to put them in there, and I will make sure you see them. <laughs> okay, great. Um, is there any? Um, are there any? Uh, were there any sort of? Um, you know, do you have to pull any punches? You know, these are people that are. Still still around, still active, still in public life? Was there something you felt like, you know, you couldn't talk about or people told you you shouldn't talk about or anything like that? No, you know, the surprising thing is like most everybody was pretty open and, and on the record. The only, you know, I would say we, we, there were a couple times when we go off the record and they were typically related to someone who's making a commentary about their family, um, like a parent or a, a brother or a spouse. Like that's when we would have to go off the record. But it's been 20 years. You know, they a lot of these people, while they live big public lives, uh, this is a distant part of that life now. And I think the thing that they asked me to do was just be as accurate as I could be. Um, and, and, you know, and I, the way I responded to that was by not depending on their memories as much as I depended on the paper records that I was able to get access to. Mm. Um, I, I would say, you know, you asked the question about pulling punches. I don't think there's any punches I pulled. I didn't choose to write certain stories because they didn't seem to me to be that, kind of like that important or sort of rise to the level of, hey, this is really defining, you know? Um, so I suppose there may be some things. I, I will say that I wish I had been able to expand the Omaha section by like double the pages because yeah. Omaha is a big part of PayPal success, but I was constrained by room and readability and all the rest. But Omaha is the reason that PayPal doesn't have a customer service problem. Um, and it's the solution to a, a massive, massive backlog of customer service complaints I tried to capture it. I wish I could have gone on. Actually, a whole chapter could have been devoted to just Omaha. Uh -huh. um, but no, none of these these people at this point, 20 years on, they sort of said, you know, have at it. Just like uh, they, they I, I actually said to one of them, I said, my ambition is that I'm going to write a book so that you learn new things about the experience mm -hmm. you had. 
um, because I'll get stories that you wouldn't have, you wouldn't know. Has anyone, um, have any of them had a chance to read the book yet? I know it's not even released yet, but have you, have you sent copies? Have you gotten any comments or feedback from people you talked to? Well, they, they're nothing if not industrious and a, a couple of them have managed to get copies. Okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm not in, I, I try to maintain a pretty good distance between sort of source and writer. I, I'm, there's nobody with their thumb on the scale. Uh, I, I got a, a little feedback on an early something, something, somehow something had gotten to somebody about a puzzle in the book that I had gotten incorrect. Yeah. <laughs> like, I love those puzzles. Like those I, were great. Yeah. Yeah. The, the math puzzles, I like, I look, I was like, I'm not pretending like I have knowledge there, but somebody had said like, you got this, you got a little part of this wrong. You might want to fix this and move this. Um, but otherwise, no, I kept a pretty decent firewall between myself and out of, res- out of just as much respect for them as, as respect for the process. Like it's weird if in a story about, several hundred people, like I had to balance this sort of symphony, right? Like you can't have like one person just take over for the whole thing. Um, uh, you know, I, I tried to write the truth. I tried to write as honestly as possible and to give both sides a fair hearing on any significant debates. Uh, I hope I, you know, I hope I hit the mark. Yeah, you did a great, you did a great job. I thought that was uh, yeah, very, very balanced. I mean, very nice. You gave everyone's perspective. I think you were fair. I don't think anyone... I don't, I don't know the story, but it didn't seem like anybody got raw, a raw deal. It seemed like, oh, I'm like, oh, what about a different perspective? And you would always, you know, sort of come with it. So you, the, the fairness and sort of the open mindedness of the, you know, the process really comes through. Um, is you know, is there anything else you want to say about the book that you know we haven't we haven't touched on in this conversation? You know, I I hadn't thought about it until this morning. I was listening to. Um, a commentary from a friend of mine, Katie Boyle, who wrote a piece about American dynamism. Uh-huh. And I suspect it like sort of overlaps more into your world now. I'm not well read on this literature, but it's been given many different phrases, right? There's sort of this like contingent of like, we should build. And then there's uh, Derek Thompson had written a piece. Um, you know, Mark Andreessen's commented on this. And uh, Katie was, Katie's a friend and she wrote this piece about American dynamism. And I don't know that I have anything to say on it that's not going to be better said by people like you or her. Um, this is a dynamic time in Silicon Valley, the late 1990s and early 2000s. And the people who are at the heart of this story to this day, they're fun interlocutors because they're so dynamic. Mm. I don't know. Um, I, I think a culture will get what it celebrates. And I think that I didn't do this. I wrote the book to tell the story of what happened. I didn't write it as an advocacy piece. Yeah. But if there is a slight hint of like, optimism or dynamism in it, I I take that to be a good thing because I think we need to celebrate people who are willing to sort of look at, uh, you know, payments on eBay, (laughs) let's say, uh, and say, you did it wrong. I'm going to do it better, right? Um, There's something healthy about that. It's something that is actually very uniquely American. It goes back to de Tocqueville, right? And so my thought here is not that I want to make the book more than it is. It is not a, a, it is designed to tell the story but I find that it comes at a time when there's a new and emerging literature that you're probably more familiar with around this idea of sort of, you know, America getting its groove back, <laughs> you yeah. know, for lack of a better expression. Um, I'm glad if that, if it, if it helps there, great. I think we, we need it, the, the tradition of immigrant entrepreneurs who build cool things. Uh, we ought to embrace and celebrate that. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. I mean, one of the things that you talk about in the book is uh, Reed Hoffman is a uh, liberal and he knows um, uh, Peter Thiel is a conservative and they're, you know, they're friends from Stanford and they, you know, they have these sort of philosophical debates. I think are even a philosophy class together and, you know, they, they, they both become involved in politics and they've gone in different directions, but there was, you know, this, they could come together, they could build something and they probably, they probably agree on a lot more than you know a lot of people would, would suspect. I think that similar experience and a similar appreciation for dynamism and growth. I mean, I think they both have that. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. I mean, is there a, do you, do you, so you've had such a you know varied career uh, writing on different things. Do you know what the next project is? Are you ready to talk about it, or just uh, uh, just gonna focus on talking about this book and promoting it for a while? Yeah, I think you know you're in this game as well. Like you do have to do a little bit of of kind of telling people about the project because if you don't, no one's going to hear about it, and things are too noisy, and books are really long, and you know the crown is better. And sure. <laughs> um, uh, but I I've been sort of noodling on a couple of things. I got really interested in criminal justice reform as a result of this project, um, and I met a woman who was wrongfully incarcerated 36 years ago. Uh, her name is Judy Henderson. She was uh, given a full pardon a few years back. And her fight for her freedom is 
Like it's like unlike anything I've ever heard. Um, and I, I have a, I want, I'm going to work with her on that. Um, I just, her, she's, she has a spine of Damascus steel. Like this is just somebody that, and I've met a lot of interesting people. Um, I don't, I have never met anyone like her. Like she's just really remarkable. Uh -huh. And to, to fight for your freedom and to fight for a wrongful conviction for three and a half decades when like every year you're told no, mm -hmm. like spending time with her makes it, makes my complaints like they, it, it makes them vanish. Like I have not, you know, and sort of like you, you walk away and you're like, this, this paper cut is not worth complaining about. Right. Um, and I, by the way, I'm not trying to minimize, I'm trying to minimize it. It just, so her story is remarkable. <laughs> and then, I was, I have like the, these like folders, right. Of like projects. But the other one is two summers ago, a friend of a, a friend of a friend who was an astronaut went to the international space station. And I somehow talked him into talking to me and to my friend every Sunday for six months. So I have like 24 audio files from space, uh -huh. right. Where we're just communicating uh -huh. about space things. And his name is Chris Cassidy and he has lived an, an amazing life. And this was his last mission to space. And you know, shaving is interesting in space. Like, yeah. like every, everything is interesting in space. Mm -hmm. And so we would have these like, very lively chats about what it means to, to leave the earth, to go there and to do what he had to do. And I think there's like, you know, there's a lot of writing about space. That's about like the blue origin SpaceX, the space logistics, that the sort of mechanics of how you build companies and how the private sector interacts with the public sector. I wanted to like still understand the people who are like, you know, being being hurled into space on tops of rockets like that was interesting to me so i may do something with that but my focus after this will be making sure that this book has a good reception and then judy's story which deserves a wider audience okay yeah we'll be watching and we'll be you know very interested in, in what you do so jimmy thank you so much for joining us and i'm glad you were here thanks a lot richard thank you